tonight actually finishing up the book of Hosea. And so next week we will begin with the uh, prophet of uh, Joel, Joel, actually Yoel. Uh, so anyway, we won't be saying Yoel, I can assure you of that. But that's, uh, that's next week. But tonight we're in Hosea. So as you turn in Hosea, let's pray one more time. Father, thank you. Uh, for this book, but thank you for the entire Bible. Thank you for preserving every word that's in here for us, um, Lord, so that we could learn of it. We could see your justice, your uh, magnificence, your goodness, and your grace. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us see all those things tonight. We ask that you would teach us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You might ask yourself if a prophecy of judgment can have a happy ending. And of course, the answer is yes. And especially when we've got you know, the grace of God involved with the people of God, it's always going to be yes. Now, there's no denying that through this book and through a lot of this prophecy throughout the major and the minor prophets, there's been a lot said that's been harsh. And I'll be honest with you, you're going to see some more harsh stuff before Hosea comes to a close. But what is also undeniable as things come to a close here is the magnificent love of God that he has towards his people understand they had forgotten him they had abused the love and the provision that God had given them and yet he still holds out to them a future of forgiveness and restoration whatever judgment that they were about to face in the present it was going to be huge they still had a God-given promise of healing why is that because we just sang about it the grace of God is amazing it's always amazing now, we've got to remember the background to the book as we bring things to a close here. The northern kingdom of Israel, also known as Ephraim, also known as Samaria, it was nearing the end of its independence. Uh, you had generation after generation that had idolatrous sin and rebellion against God. God then is bringing his judgment upon them. Soon he would bring in the Assyrians as his tool of his wrath, um, just thoroughly punishing the northern ten tribes for their sin. And really, uh, you know, they would all be all but completely destroyed, mostly bred out by the Assyrians. Um, obviously, remnant exists through the, the centuries and even today, but uh, mostly all gone. And so thorough would this destruction be that, you know, in all the centuries following, we, we don't generally refer to uh, that group of people in that land as the Israelites. We refer to them as the Jews in reference to the southern kingdom of Judah. Right, And so that's how we, we know them today. The northern tribes of Israel are barely known at all, and they really won't be until the days of the Great Tribulation. They'll be very well known. But in any case, that's intense. So from something that intense, can anything good be brought from it? And of course the answer is yes. Throughout Hosea, God repeatedly promised to restore his people, knowing that one day, one day they would come to a full knowledge of him, they would worship him in truth. It may take a while, but it was certain it would happen. God declared it to be so. Now, all of this, you might recall, is mirrored in the marriage relationship that Hosea had with his wife, Gomer. Uh, like Israel, Gomer had been repeatedly unfaithful to her husband, yet Hosea purchased her back in grace. He restored her, restored her children to a place of faithfulness and purity with him. And this is what God promised to do with Israel. They had acted like they weren't his people, acted like they had received no mercy from God, acted like they were divorced from God. Well, all that would change God would shower them with mercy, restore them as his people, take them back as his betrothed. Now, this is emphasized once more as these prophecies come to an end. Throughout this book, we've seen this cycle of judgment, then mercy. Judgment, then mercy. We see that one more time here, right? After warning the nation of the judgment, of uh, all the things they would reap because they had sown sin, they sowed the wind, they would reap the whirlwind. Well, God, after that point, re reiterated his loving heart, his compassion towards his people. Remember how his sympathies, his heart was turned and churned for his people, promised to bring them back to their land, restoring them to their dwelling places. Well, okay, judgment to mercy. So at this point, we've got another cycle, the final cycle of judgment to mercy. Israel forgot God. Uh, they ignored all of his gracious provision in history. But God had not forgotten them. God knew exactly the relationship he was supposed to have with his people, and he knew what was necessary to get their attention. And so one day he'd have it, and the love of God would flow freely upon them. Guys, as we get into this, we don't want to forget God as our God. He's given us grace. He's given us blessing. That's not something for us to take for granted. We want to remember our Lord dwell in his grace. So really, Hosea 12 and 13 is all talking about how 
various ways that Israel had forgotten God. So you might say Israel forgot God part one in chapter 12. And as we mentioned last week, really this begins with the last verse of chapter 11. And it says this, Ephraim has encircled me with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah still walks with God, even with the Holy One who is faithful. Again, remember these chapter breaks aren't inspired. The Hebrew text actually has this verse as chapter 12, verse 1, if you would. Um, it makes more sense in that position because it does begin this next cycle of, of judgment. We also need to remember that although Hosea was primarily a prophet to the northern kingdom, he does have occasional words for the southern kingdom of Judah as well. And here in chapter 11, verse 12, it seems that Judah might here be seen in a good light, but chapter 12, verse 2 makes it clear that Judah had fault of her own. The primary observation that God's making here is that although many of the same sins were shared by the two sister kingdoms, they happened in different time frames. At the time that Israel was conquered by Assyria, well, at that time, King Hezekiah reigned on the throne of Judah. We know Hezekiah as being one of the best kings in all of Judah's history. It was no exaggeration at all for God at this point in time to say that Judah was walking with him in faithfulness. In fact, God would sovereignly protect Judah from the empire of the Assyrians in a miraculous fashion. We remember he destroyed 185,000 of Sennacherib's soldiers in a single night. Because Judah was walking with God, God would protect his people according to their covenant promise. But it wouldn't always be that way. Like Israel, Judah would also turn again to sin. She'd face her own judgment of God, of course, at that time by the hand of the Babylonians. So it's to this that the prophecy refers as the English versions of chapter 12 begin. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind. He daily increases lies and desolation. And they also they make a covenant with the Assyrians and oil is carried to Egypt. The Lord also brings a charge against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his deeds, he will recompense him. Now, in addition to all of Israel's instances of idolatry, their very basic lack of trust in the Lord is confirmed how by all their attempts at various uh, political alliances. When facing their enemies, they did not trust God. Hezekiah trusted God. He laid the letter of the Assyrians before the Lord and gave it up to God. Now, Israel had not done that. They tried instead political solutions. They tried making alliances. They tried doing things by the hand of man, all of which were futile. Now, we say all of that in comparison with Judah, but historically we know that the southern kingdom of Judah wasn't all that much better. They may not have sinned at the same time as Israel in the same way, but they did engage in the same sorts of sins at different times. And so it says here, God brought a charge against them as well. So the whole Hebrew nation, northern and southern kingdoms, the whole Hebrew nation is guilty. They would be punished by God. How would he do it? He promised to punish them, as it says, according to his ways. Now, that's a frightening thought according to his ways, if the wages of the sin is death, how much needs to be dealt out for every single additional sin? And we think, well, a single quick death is really too good to punish according to our ways would mean an eternity of deaths, which, by the way, is exactly what hell provides. Now, that's horrendous, it's terrifying, but it's righteous. That is an expression of God's holy justice, and this is exactly why we need mercy, this is why we need the cross. Jesus at the cross endured the full, the infinite wrath of God when he hung on the cross and died for us. Because Jesus is the Son of God, his death fulfills an eternity of deaths for all mankind, which is why your death is covered in his death. His death is sufficient for you and for me. And that's why we cry out for mercy. We put all of our trust in Christ Jesus alone. Talking about Israel, or the, the nation as a whole, he picks up again in verse 3. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. Now, this is going to be the first of several brief historical recollections. God basically here recounts the story of how Israel became Israel. And you can read basically the story in Genesis chapter 32. It shows Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord the night before his return into the promised land. He was about to face his brother Esau. It was really uh, troubling him, and that's when he sees the Lord and wrestles with him. Understand that Jacob had schemed and trusted himself his entire life till he's finally forced into a position where he's got no other choice except to trust the Lord. You know, from the womb onward, he's you know grabbing at the heel. Basically, his whole life he struggled until that night in Bethel. Uh, and finally, um, 
Of course, Bethel is when he saw the ladder to God, but at Penuel when he wrestled with God. But finally, Jacob wrestled with the Lord. Jacob refused to let go, and that is the moment that he came to true faith. Now, keep in mind, this is exactly what Israel as a nation did not do, right? They weren't wrestling with the Lord. They were wrestling against the Lord, against his will for them. They did not want to cling to God like Jacob didn't want to let God go. No, they had no desire to hold God at all. They turned away from their national foundation, and they were about to experience all the consequences that would come to that. Obviously, we want to cling to God. We want to take hold of Jesus. You know, he's taken hold of us. We don't let go of him. Thankfully, he doesn't let go of us. Nothing can separate us from his love. Well, to whom did Jacob cling? Obviously, he clung to the angel of the Lord, which is the incarnate God, the pre-incarnate Jesus. Uh, he clung to the Lord himself, and in fact, it goes on to emphasize that verse 5. That is the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorable name. It's very interesting because on the night that Jacob actually wrestled with God, Jacob, you might recall, asked God his name and received no answer. Genesis 32, 19. Why do you ask me my name? And, and it goes to demonstrate the further blessing that the nation of Israel received beyond what their ancestor had because God had not even revealed his name to Jacob but Israel as a nation later knew God's name. That was revealed to them out through Moses and to the rest of the nation. So they had a greater revelation of God in their lives, yet they still despised the Lord. You know, when you take this verse and you look at a more literal translation, it's interesting. You know, you think it actually says, And Yahweh, God of Sabaoth, Yahweh, God of armies, Yahweh, his memorial or his remembrance. So you think of it this way, the ever-existent I am, Yahweh, that name, is Yahweh is God of all the heavenly armies. That I am, that's the name he's given us to remember him, to know him. The whole idea, again, this, what this is trying to put across is this grace that's given in terms of God's personal revelation to his people. Israel did not just know any God. Israel did not had the revelation of one of many choices of God. Israel knew and was known by Yahweh God, the God, the ever-existed, all-powerful, mighty God. That's the God who revealed himself to the nation. That's the God they chose to forget. We want to remember our God. We want to keep Jesus ever before us, praying at all times in the Spirit. We have received, think of it, even greater revelation than Israel did. Because the Lord Jesus has shown us the Father. So we want to cherish that revelation. So in light of that, what was the nation supposed to do? They were supposed to repent. Look at verse 6. So you, by the help of your God, return, observe mercy and justice, and wait on your God continually. So they needed to repent. They needed to return to God. Now, this takes place several ways. First, it takes place spiritually, right? Because it's by the help of your God. They're unable to do it on their own. God has to help them repent. God has to help us repent. He moves in us to do so. Second is to take place practically. They're observing mercy, chesed, that loyal love, observing that compassion of God. They're observing justice. They're living out their lives as people who are called to be the people of God. Right? They're to walk worthy of the calling with which we were called, as we might say in the New Testament. Third, it's supposed to take place devotionally because they are to wait on their God continually. So they're seeking Him constantly in prayer and in worship. So in other words, every bit of their life is to be affected through repentance. So this here is not a call for lip service. It's not a call for religious mo motions. This is a call to pure life change, a true turning back to God. That's repentance. Now, if that doesn't describe repentance in your life, that kind of radical change, then you need to ask yourself if you've ever repented. Because turning to God is far more than just praying a so-called sinner's prayer. It's a true dedication of our entire lives to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And that's what they're called to do right here. It goes on, he says in verse 7, changing the idea a little bit, a cunning Canaanite, deceitful scales are in his hand. He loves to oppress. And Ephraim said, Surely I've become rich. I have found wealth for myself and all my labors. They shall find in me no iniquity that is sin. Uh, quite a bit of attitude, cockiness here. And this kind of attitude is exactly what Israel had been warned about centuries earlier. You might recall in Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 20, talking about the day when God finally took them in there into the land and the Hebrews would eventually get cocky. They would take credit for, 
for the blessings that God gave them in the land. God gave them a land where they didn't build the houses, they didn't plant the vineyards. It was all given to them. But eventually Israel would think, well, we made ourselves rich. We did everything on our own. We don't need the Lord. He prophesied that would happen way back in Deuteronomy chapter 8. God warned them it would happen. Of course, they ignored the warnings, just like we so often do. But the bottom line is that they had forgotten God. And again, as we mentioned earlier, they may have forgotten God, but God did not forget them. Look at verse 9. But I am the Lord your God, ever since the land of Egypt. I will again make you dwell in tents, as in the days of the appointed feast. I have also spoken by the prophets and have multiplied visions. I have given symbols through the witness of the prophets. God's saying, I'm still God. He's still sovereign over Israel. And just as he had brought them out of Egypt into the promised land, he could take them out of the promised land again. Doesn't that sound like something so many of our parents said? I brought you into this world, and I could take you out again. And that's what God says to his people here. I am still sovereign over you, he's saying. We still have this covenant relationship. You may have forgotten it, but this is an unbreakable covenant. He's going to enforce it. So this is no rash decision. God warned them repeatedly through the prophets, as he said, and all these visions. I've given you these symbols. You should know these things. Verse 11. Though Gilead has idols, surely they are vanity. Though they sacrifice bulls and Gilgal, indeed their altars shall be heaps in the furrows of the field. So they trusted their idols, but their idols are useless. Soon they'd be tossed aside. Now this is not really a prophecy of future repentance at this point, so much as it is a prophecy of future destruction. Uh, we would love to think that they were the ones, the Israelites were the ones who cast aside their pagan altars, but that's not the idea. The idea is that they're destroyed, you know, uh, by the, the people who are coming in to have war against the Israelites. These aren't Israelites having revival. These are Israelites getting beat down, and so all their pagan altars get beat down with them. By the way, um, there's actually a little bit of wordplay going on here in the Hebrew. You've got c- cities like Gilead and Gilgal. Um, then you've also got this saying, heaps, or some of your translations say heaps of stones or ruins, and that's galayim, all right? Galem, rather, galem. So you've got that still G and L sort of sound, those consonants, and that wordplay. And the idea, of course, is heaps, or you might think of when some graves are, are, are made, you have this heap of stones right on top of the graves. Well, that's kind of the idea here. And it's very interesting that when you're looking this up in all of the... Uh, uh, the um, uh, dictionaries and lexicons, there is only the, the most minuscule bit of difference between um, this word that would refer to heap of stones and an almost identical word that refers to human feces. And I know that's gross. It's, the distinction is only a couple of vowels, which the original Hebrew text did not contain. So it's very much could be pointed there. Now, this is not arguing for a different translation, but I don't think it's any, uh, any accident that God chose that word to describe idolatry. This shows how disgusting God thinks idolatry actually is. Anyway, verse 12. Jacob fled to the country of Syria. Israel served for a spouse and for a wife he tended sheep. By a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet, he was preserved. Some more historical reminders here. First thing we see is God made Israel a nation. You might recall it was Jacob's scheming that sent him to to cause him to flee to Syria. But it was in Syria that he met his wives and he had his 12 children, or 12 boys, and he had daughters on top of that. right? And all this is due to the provision of God. Israel as a nation did not exist apart from the graciousness of God. So God made Israel a nation. Second thing we see here is that God gave Israel a home. The people had been enslaved for 400 years in Egypt, firmly ruled over by a pharaoh who was finally seeking their destruction. And there's no way that Israel could have or should have survived apart from the Lord God, and God did it. Not only did he bring them out of slavery, remember, he brought them out rich. They plundered the Egyptians on their way out because the Egyptians were basically throwing gold and silver at them. Please get out as soon as you can. Then third, God gave Israel protection. For 40 years, the nation wandered through the wilderness. They were led by Moses, and they could have been picked off by other nations larger than them, but they weren't. They could have starved to death, but they didn't. They could have had their supplies run out, but they never did. The preservation was there because of the gracious hand of God. So God had been truly evident throughout all their lives, throughout all their centuries, throughout all their existence. So with that in mind, how does Israel thank God for his provision? They despised him. And verse 14 says they provoked him to wrath. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore, his Lord will leave the guilt of bloodshed upon them and return his approach upon him. 
So time and time again, Israel engaged in idolatry. They sought after other gods. They acted in unrighteousness. They became exactly like all the pagan nations all around them. Despite God's gracious provision for them, they provoked him with their sin. How many times can somebody provoke God and think that nothing's going to happen? Eventually, God's patience runs out. Sooner or later, there will be consequences with them and with us. Just because we got away with sin for a season doesn't mean he'll let us get away with it forever. Eventually, we'll be found out. So that was part one. Part two of their forgetting of God begins in chapter 13. When Ephraim spoke, trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended through Baal worship, he died. You might recall we mentioned Ephraim is normally another name for the entire nation of Israel. Contextually here it seems to refer to one of the tribes because he exalted himself within Israel. Ephraim was one of the largest tribes in the northern kingdom, was powerful among his brethren. But the idea is he was still weak before God. His idolatry brings only death. And you would think that they would learn their lesson, but they didn't. Verse 2, now they sinned more and more. They made for themselves molded images, idols of all their silver, according to their skill. All of it is the work of craftsmen. They say of them, let them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. Uh, therefore, they shall be like the morning cloud. And like the early dew that passes away, like chaff blown off from a threshing floor, and like smoke from a chimney. The people multiply their idolatry. They dug deeper and deeper into sin. And not only did they make all these images, but they got more and more ridiculous. They engaged in every pagan ritual they saw, modeling themselves after the world around them rather than the word of God that had been given to them. Which is a solid warning for us to make sure that everything we're doing is based on the word of God, not on the culture and the whims and the, the, the things that pass by around us. But all of this, it shows that they would be wasted. Not only were their religious acts wasted time, but they themselves are going to be blown away by the judgment of God. That's the whole idea behind verse 3, filled with all these images of these wispy things, fleeting things. There's nothing here of substance, nothing that's going to last, and that's exactly the way that people would be, be just gone. Like the morning dew that just evaporates is gone. That's what sin always is. Sin is fleeting pleasures with eternal consequences. A few seconds of sin can infect an entire life Got to be very, very careful with that. Verse 4, Yet I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. This is a repetition of chapter 12, verse 9. The first clause here, even though we've got different words in English, the first clause is exactly the same wording. Okay, exactly the same wording. God never forgot his people. He knew precisely the terms of their covenant. He acts in accordance with it. You know, even with this general background of judgment, we still, though, see a plea for repentance, right? God was their God. God's their only God. They have no hope at all without Him. They have no hope of salvation without Him. Salvation does not exist without Him. It cannot be found except in the Lord. That hasn't changed, has it? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is one way. He is our salvation. There is no Savior besides me. That word Savior, by the way, is the same place where Jesus gets his earthly name. This is still Yeshua right here. He is the Savior of the world, given to the world. And so God gives an example of what his salvation, his deliverance, his provision looks like. Verse 5, I knew you in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. When they had pasture, they were filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, they forgot me. And again, it's a reminder of how God intervened in their history. For 40 years, God provided for their every need, yet they still forgot. They still turned aside from God. Now, keep in mind that pretty much all of this happened during times when, during times when things were good. At least we might say good relatively speaking. Now, it's not that the Hebrews didn't struggle along the way. They obviously did. They had a lot of trials. They had a lot of tests of faith. But from a broader perspective, we've got to think, spiritually speaking, God's provision for them, they had everything going on their behalf, right? For a time, especially during those wilderness wanderings, they could wake up, the entire nation of Israel, anybody, man, woman, child, anybody could wake up in the morning and visibly see the manifestation of God's glory on a daily basis. They saw the cloud leading them through the wilderness. They saw the glory hovering over the tabernacle. They could visibly see the glory of God. They partook of a miraculous provision of food every single morning. 
course, once they got to the promised land, they finally went inside. Then there's no doubt that God miraculously gave it to them. You start reading the accounts of Joshua. It's obvious to all of them. God is the one who supernaturally gave us this land. Things had gone extraordinarily well for Israel. It's not as if God had hidden himself from them in any way. It's not as if God had even held back a scotch of his blessings. And in the midst of all of that, they forgot God. Not that God hadn't made himself known. It's that they had to willingly, purposefully shut their eyes to the things God had done. We pray so often for things to go well for us. We pray so often, God, show yourself in this situation. But do we sometimes forget and choose to forget God when things are going well? Do we shut our eyes during those times when we have experienced those blessings? We just start coasting and relaxing and thinking, I've got this all handled. I would suggest that those are the times it's most important for us to be on our knees and stay humble before God, lest we get taken down by our own sin. Verse 7, So I will be to them like a lion, like a leopard by the road. I will lurk. I will meet them like a bear deprived of her cubs. I will tear open their rib cage. I will devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. This is terrible truth. He's promising. He's guaranteeing, I'm going to ambush you in fury. Like a wild animal, he's going to tear them limb from limb. It's graphic. It's awful. It's fully deserved. But that's not all. We've got to go on to verse 9. Oh, Israel, you are destroyed, but your help is from me. Israel would be destroyed by God, but they would also be healed by God. He would be the one to help them. Think of it this way. It's like the surgeon who has to perform life-saving emergency open-heart surgery. What happens with that? Well, they've got to crack open a person's chest, and that's an act that would normally kill anyone. It's something incredibly traumatic, yet that same surgeon performs the operation, seals everything shut, heals the wound, and helps the person live again. Kind of a similar idea here, though combined with God's righteous wrath. Yes, God would rip open the nation and bring them to death and destruction, but he would also be their help and their healer. He would kill, but he would bring life. There was destruction in the future for Israel. We know that because the Assyrians did come in. But there was also restoration. There was a time when they would be put in a right relationship with the Lord God. So he would be the one to heal them. He would be the one to lead them. Look at verse 10. I will be your king. Where is any other that he may save you in all their cities? Where are your judges to whom you said, give us a king, give me a king and princes. I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. So God Almighty is their true king. Now in the past, God gave them kings because they stubbornly asked for kings. And God took them away. There were, especially in Israel, there were a lot that rose up and went down again. But originally they had been led by God himself, and that was the way it was always supposed to have been. They rejected God as their king. God knew they had rejected him. Now understand, this though is going to be restored in the future kingdom. When Jesus sits on the throne of David, again, Israel will be ruled over by God Almighty himself as their personal king. That's something that's going to be restored. That's for the future. In the present, though, their sin is building and building and building. Verse 12, the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is stored up. The sorrows of a woman in childbirth shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long where children are born. The, the idea is the nation is pregnant with sin and iniquity. They're about ready to burst. You see some women who are walking along, you think, oh man, you just can't wait for them to have their children because they look so miserable in that state. And they certainly feel that way. Now that's for a wonderful thing. Here it's a terrible thing. Somebody's just ready to burst open because of the sin. The sin's going to come violently forth. It wouldn't be pretty. What they needed was help. But that's what God promised to give. Look at verse 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. Now you need to know that commentaries are split on how this ought to be translated and interpreted because of the overall context of judgment, which we've seen a lot of leading up to this, some believe this should not be read so much as a promise of grace, but a question of how much God should allow the people to be disciplined. 
the idea here, according to this idea, could be, shall I redeem them from the power of the grave? Shall I redeem them from death? Now, there is some question on the grammatical basis for that conclusion. It's kind of sketchy, which is why most English translations, I notice with the, the one exception of the New American Standard, the most English translations translate like what we have here, a statement that, of something God will do. And you say, well, what about this context of, of judgment? Well, contextually, there's no problem with a, a quick view and a quick jump to mercy. That sort of just real quick back and forth. That's been commonly seen throughout the book of Hosea so far. And when we consider the way Paul used this verse when he uh, took a different translation of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 and 55, uh, Paul obviously saw this verse as being merciful. He saw it being one of a, a promise of victory rather than a promise of foreboding. There's this promise that God will help his people. No matter how bad his people had sinned against God, God is bigger than their sin. No matter how much they had incurred a death sentence against themselves, God is bigger than death. All they need to do is turn to him in faith and live. Guys, that's the promise we have in Jesus. No matter how much we've sinned against God, Jesus is bigger than our sin. No matter how much death we've received and should receive, Jesus is bigger than then our death and his resurrection proves that we have that guarantee of life because he's risen from the grave. So that's why we can say, oh, grave, where is your victory? Where is your sting? There's no more sting. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. So it's a very brief look into God's mercy. Chapter 13 does conclude, though, with this reiteration of this judgment. Verse 15, though he is fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, then his spring shall become dry and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall plunder the treasury of every desirable prize. Samaria is held guilty, for she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child ripped open. Again, very violent, very graphic, just like chapter, uh, verses 7 and verses 8 were violent and graphic, emphasized again here. Israel at the time could have been fruitful, could have been prosperous, but it wasn't going to last. This wrath-filled wind of the wrath of God would come, and the kingdom would be decimated. Now, it's a big difference between these promises of God's victory over death that we just looked at, but for good reason, right? Verses 15 and 16, that's what Israel deserved. That's what we deserve. Verse 14 is what God graciously gives in Christ. Right? Verse 15 and 16 are just as verse 14 is grace. And you've got to see both. Well, that is a lot of judgment, but that's not how the book ends. It, it concludes with this appeal to repentance and this promise of restoration because in chapter 14, we see that Israel will one day remember God. Verse 1, O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Stop there. This is the plea. Turn around. Come back to God. Come back to God. Just like what we saw earlier, this is repentance. It's a turning. It's a change. And remember from chapter 12, verse 6. Repentance is this dedication of our lives unto God. And this is what Hosea once more implores the nation of Israel to do. Turn around. He's basically saying, come back from the sinful place that you've led yourself into. The only thing you're accomplishing in your sin is your downfall. You're stumbling there. Come back to the Lord. The door is wide open for you to do so. It's been said so often. You know, we take so many steps away from the Lord, but it just takes one step back. It's a turning I love that from the, the, the ministry that's called You Turn for Christ. It's just turn around and go back. He's right there. That same invitation is open to anyone who's stumbling in sin. We return to the Lord. Go back to the one who's called you by his grace. Well, how would they do it? Hosea gives them a suggestion of a prayer. Say to them, as he goes on in verse 2, Say to them, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods, for in you the fatherless finds mercy. Let's summarize those requests. Number one, forgive us our sin. That's the first request. Forgive us our sin. The first thing we need is forgiveness. Our sin stands between us and God, and that has to first be resolved before we can move on to anything else in our relationship with God. Now, thankfully, the promise is clear that if we confess our sin through Jesus Christ, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. 
He will take away our iniquity. He will receive us in his grace and love. So their first request, they're asking for forgiveness. The second thing they say is that we're going to praise you. We will praise you. This is the, the sacrifices of their lips. Their hearts would turn to the Lord in praise and devotion. Through their songs and prayers, they would proclaim the praises of God. And this is what repentant people do. Repentant people are ready to praise God. Yes, there is godly sorrow for the moment because that's what brings us to that place of repentance. But when forgiveness is granted, we know we've received it because we receive it by faith, then praise can erupt and gush forth. We will praise you. Third thing, they say, we will trust you. For so long, they relied on alliances. They relied even on alliances with Assyria, the nation that would come in and conquer them, but no more. Now they were declaring their trust in God. They were declaring their trust in the one who had always provided for them in the past. This is something we also we see for repentant people. Repentant people are people who trust God. After all, if he's our hope for forgiveness and we can trust him for forgiveness, surely we can trust him for everything else. Everything else is a piece of cake in light of forgiveness. Forgiveness takes care of an eternity of death. Everything else is just gravy. And he says, we will worship you, right? No longer they're going to trust their works of their hands. They had trusted themselves for decades. They had worshiped every god but the true God for as long as they could remember. But now their worship would be the true God, the one that they knew by his memorial name. Repentant people are worshipful people. Not just our lips that praise God, it's our lives. Everything we are is dedicated to the Lord Jesus, living for his glory. And then the last thing that they affirm is that you are good. God is a merciful God, giving his love and compassion to orphans. Who are the orphans? Well, we are. We had orphaned ourselves away from God in our sin. And he still extended his merciful compassion to us. God gives us forgiveness to the rebellious. He is truly good. So repentant people know, trust, and declare the goodness of God. We're astounded by his nature, amazed at his grace. You know, just in general, this is a great model for prayer, isn't it? When you pray, anytime you go to prayer, you can ask for forgiveness because you know you've sinned at some point between then and the last time you prayed. But you can ask for forgiveness. You can declare your praise or trust, your worship of God. You can acknowledge his goodness. If you follow that as a model, you'll never be at a loss for word and prayer. This is a prayer that God answers. We see in verse 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. First thing we see is that God will heal. He'll bring them back from the edge of apostasy. Backsliding could be translated apostasy. He will restore his people, bring them back into his covenant graces, bring them back into that relationship. Second thing is God said he'll love. It would be enough for God just to turn from his wrath, but he promises so much more than that. He will freely love his people. Those who were once his enemies, he loves now as his family. But he does say that he will forgive. Instead of pouring out his anger, he turns that anger away. He turns his wrath away. He releases them from the debt that they have against him, allowing them to be fully restored in relationship. This is what God does for us through Jesus Christ. He forgives us. He heals us. He brings us back from that place of uh, being an enmity against him. And then he brings us into that relationship. He loves us freely. One more promise here, by the way. It says that God will bless. It picks up in verse 5. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots to Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be to the wine or shall be like the wine of Lebanon. So God promised to bless them, and we see this by his strengthening, first strengthening the nation itself. The kingdom shrunk dramatically, and of course it would be gone almost entirely after they were conquered. Uh, but it would grow once again, is the idea. Experiences vitality, experiences blessing once again. It becomes rooted, this miraculous restoration. The fact that Israel exists at all is a testimony to the supernatural working of the sovereign God. And we'll see this again as Israel grows stronger and stronger and stronger, not only with his kingdom be restored, but so would their reputation. They would be a blessing to the other nations of the world. You know, they, they dwell under his shadow. That hasn't quite happened yet. Israel is a blessing to a lot of ways to the, the, the rest of the, the world. Their exports are amazing and their technology and all the rest. But as far as the other nations of the world dwelling under its shadow, that hasn't happened yet. When is that going to happen? That's going to happen during the millennial kingdom. Because it's from there that Jesus will reign on the throne of David. 
Verse 8, Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard and observed him. I'm like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. So finally, after all that time, finally, Israel says, No more idols. I'm done. Their only provision is found in the Lord God, and they will long last acknowledge him as such. And the only sad part is how long it takes. You could say that even today, right? Even today, with as much as God has done for Israel, they still don't yet follow the Lord in faith because they still reject Jesus as Messiah. You could even make the argument that they're, in a lot of ways, idolaters because they follow a God of their own traditions, not the God that has been revealed to them. They wait too long. We don't want to wait too long. We want to make the decision immediately to be done with sin. So it concludes with verse 9. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. (laughs) He says, you know, what's the lesson here? Pay attention. Know the Lord. Walk in his ways. The promises of God towards his people are so very wonderful that all they needed to do was turn to him in true repentance and faith. They needed to remember their God, but that's exactly what they did not do. They had forgotten the Lord. They turned away from him, and despite all of his provision over all the centuries, they shut their eyes to the things God had done. They chose to go their own way in idolatry. They had acted every way that unfaithful spouse, just like Gomer did to her husband Hosea. So we say, was God right to judge them? Absolutely he was, no question about it. All of these prophecies about the Assyrian invasion were well-deserved. This was God's righteous, divine judgment. But what makes Hosea's prophecies so wonderful is that those weren't the only things that God promised. God didn't only promise judgment. God promised mercy. He promised restoration. He promised healing. That's what the Israelites will experience when they finally do turn to God in true remembrance and faith. And guys, that is what we experience through Jesus right now. We don't have to wait for the eventual outpourings of God's mercies. We live in them. Every single thing spoken to Israel in regards to judgment is something that we ourselves deserve, but it's something that Jesus already endured for us. So now we can live in the blessings of those who actually know the Lord. Right now, we already have God's mercy, His restoration, and His healing. So perhaps the question for us is whether or not we're walking in those mercies. Like Israel, we've also personally seen the provision of God on our behalf. If you're a born-again Christian, then you're a person who has had a personal experience with the living God. That's basically the definition of a born-again Christian. You cannot be a born-again Christian unless you've had a personal experience with the living God where he has given you life. You've repented from your sins. You put your faith and trust in him as the living God. He's given you life. You know God as God. So do you walk as if you do? Do you walk as if you remember Jesus or if you've forgotten him? All of us have days, myself included, where we act as if we don't know him. There are moments that would pop in our lives and we just kind of shut our eyes to the cross of Christ. And we plug our ears to the pleading of the Holy Spirit not to go that way. I want to be careful that those times don't become the norm. When God makes you aware of those things, confess them to Him, turn back to God in true heartfelt repentance. We know His forgiveness is freely available. All we need to do is ask. So may every day be a day that we strive to remember the Lord. May we be the wise and the prudent ones who walk in the ways of our God, ever mindful of His grace. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the grace of Jesus. Thank you for these things that you've granted us uh, because Jesus has already gone through the punishment. He's already endured your wrath. That has been fulfilled. Thank you that it is finished. And so now, Lord, we can live in your grace and your mercies, and I pray that we would have you ever before us, that as we go through our days and we're tempted to shut our eyes or plug our ears, we would not do so, but our hearts would remain humbly um, broken by you in your hand, mindful of Christ, seeking to glorify him at every turn. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of forgiveness for our failings,
thank you that your love is so incredibly good. We thank you that it's made available to us through Jesus Christ, and we pray this in his name. Amen.